You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Well, this is going to be a study in the science and art of biblical interpretation, as the notes say. And uh, so just wanted to spend some time this evening kind of going over where we're going to go and how we're going to get there a little bit. And so if you have your notes there, let's uh, let's take a look at the first couple pages here. I won't go over the the introductory part other than to say it is a, a, a science and an art biblical hermeneutics or interpretation. And um, it, it, the first part that we're going to be looking at, we're probably going to be focusing on the science part, and then later on what we might call the art or the practice of it. And um, it's a science because we're going to have certain rules to learn and apply, and then the art part is going to be in how we actually do hermeneutics, which is what we're going to be doing. One of my uh, illustrations of this idea, this concept of these two things, of course, and you've seen it, would be maybe an NFL wide receiver. When you see that NFL wide receiver come off the line and he goes out on his route, he makes a cut for the sideline, and the quarterback has already released the ball because he knows exactly where that receiver is going to be. That receiver, at that stage of his career, has learned all of the mechanics, all of the science of being a wide receiver, probably started in junior high, maybe then in high school. As he moved on and got better and better, he went to college. And of course, if he's good enough to play in the NFL and start in the NFL, he's learned the science and the art very, very well. So he runs that route and he comes to that sideline. And of course, the quarterback is also very good at what he does. He's learned the science and art of being a quarterback. So he knows exactly where that receiver is going to be. And that receiver is covered by a very skilled defensive safety, right? And uh, he's also learned his and he's all over that receiver. And so when he comes near that sideline and jumps for that ball, which has been thrown out of reach of that defender, who's all over him anyway, and he is looking at that ball, and he looks it into his hands, makes the catch. His body is out of bounds, but his toes just squeak over that line. That's a reception. You've just seen the science and art of being a wide receiver, right? And, of course, when it happens in the end zone, it's even better yet. So that's kind of what we're talking about here, the science and art of biblical interpretation, And uh, one of the things we need to remember here is that we're going to look at the Bible itself to find the rules of interpretation. Um, That third paragraph there, God has revealed himself to be all-powerful, holy, righteous, and true. Therefore, his word is inerrant, infallible, and authoritative. In other words, the Bible comes with its own set of operating instructions, okay? Okay. God just didn't give his word and then say, okay, you're on your own, figured out. Built into scripture itself are the principles of interpretation. And so our objectives, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18, Peter's last letter to the church, his last words to the church. And uh, you know his background probably, right? And by the time he reached the end of his life, this was his priority to the people he was ministering to, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we hope to do. Wherever you are in your walk with Jesus Christ, um, wherever we are, we need to keep growing. Okay, It's a lifelong process. And so understanding how to interpret the Word of God so we can apply it to our lives and use it in our lives and in our, our ministries, no matter what your ministry is, is uh, one of our objectives. But also, we're going to learn this methodology, and uh, those three principles there are what we're going to be talking about all the way through. The first one is observation, and the second one then interpretation, and then application. This is um, pretty much a tried and true uh, 
methodology. There are many books on hermeneutics you can get that deal with this very same thing. Uh, one came out just not too long ago by a couple of uh, New Testament scholars, and um, one of them's name is uh, Kostenberger. He's a New Testament scholar, and uh, they deal with these very same three principles in their book. Approach is slightly different, but it's the same basic way to uh, learn this methodology to interpret the Word of God. And it's really pretty simple, okay? You do this every day. You do this. You did this on your way here. You did it maybe 100, 200 times today, right? One of my favorite illustrations of this method, and I'll be using it quite a bit, basic stop sign, observation. What does it say, right? What does it mean by what it says? And now, what do you do? Application. Observation, interpretation, application. And so that's as simple, really, uh, the simple uh, method that we're going to be talking about. And then, to become more motivated and skilled in our communication of God's Word. This again, Romans 12, 1 and 2, we'll be looking at that passage a little later on. Um, Bible study is not designed to, be an, an, to end with you, okay? I know sometimes uh, we sort of study the Word of God and we go home and then we come back and study it some more at church, but it's designed by God to change your life, okay? And it's also designed to be communicated by you to other people, okay? We are to take what we know and use it to tell people what we know about the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can't be an endpoint in our hearts and minds. So I want you to be thinking that way. Um, when I first studied hermeneutics, it was in a it was in a church setting in a Sunday school class, and um, we used this book right here. This is a kind of a classic book. This is Bernard Ram. You'll see me quoting him two or three times in here. It's called Protestant Biblical Interpretation. Great book. Um, first came out I think 1970, and then it's had several printings since then. Very good book, and. I really got a lot out of that class, but later on when I studied it in seminary, I was highly motivated because if you believe that God has called you to teach and preach or whatever, and I wasn't sure what God wanted me to do with with my life, and half the time right now I'm still not too sure, but you know, I'm just kind of making it up as I go along. Um, you are highly motivated, and that's the first class they put you through, one of the very first classes. They don't let you anywhere near an exegetical class or you, let alone a preaching class until you have gone through their course in Bible study, and uh, hermeneutics and Bible study methods, they called it. And you know that you're just learning these <laughs> principles in order to learn how to be a better communicator of the Word of God. Okay, And so I hope you will see it in that light. Uh, you are learning some principles in order to grow spiritually yourself, but also to, to be able to communicate that to other people. And you might even be feeling or sensing, or however you want to put it, that maybe God would want to use you in some way in the future, and you want to do some additional study or reading. And um, if that's the case, I hope you follow up on it. Uh, Dave and I have talked about that, and uh, if that's the case, you need to come and talk to us, and we'll set you up with some, uh, some directed reading. Um, one of the issues here with hermeneutics is it's a massive subject area, okay? I mean, we're in the 21st century of church history, right? There's a lot of stuff out there, and we're also at a time in history where we have just easy access to everything. I mean, it's at your fingertips, right? And so it, if you want to do further study, it would probably behoove you to find out how to sort of sort through some of that a little bit and maybe get some directed reading. So please feel free to, to talk with us about that, and uh, we'd be happy to help you along the way there. So some of our objectives there, the motivation to become skilled in our communication of God's Word, but also to fellowship together as Christian men in obedience to our Savior and His Word. Uh, we are in a fellowship, and we are in, a, um, in the body of Christ, and so it's important for us to minister in that body as God has commanded us to do that through His Scripture. And um, that's, uh, those are the basic 
objectives of this class. It's going to be 12 weeks, and um, it is going to uh, go by fairly quickly. Now, if you were going to do a very exhaustive study of this, it would take a whole lot more than 12 weeks. So you have to understand this is uh, fairly narrow in its scope, but I think hopefully these objectives will be able to uh, see very clearly and um, at the end of 12 weeks have some tools in the toolbox for Bible interpretation. And so if you look over on on page 2 there, a little bit about how we're going to go and uh, where we're going and how we're going to get there, the schedule and the contents there. Um, introduction tonight, and then for the first five weeks, we're going to be working through these principles, and uh, we're, weeks three, four, and five, we're going to just walk right through those, observation, interpretation, application. One of the things I want to draw your attention to, if you haven't seen it already, is that the reading in Dr. Zook's book is uh, is going to be scheduled for you, and it's, it's scheduled out there on the pages that have the questions that you're going to be answering. And um, what I did, since chapter 12 in that book deals with application, and it's the last chapter in the book, I pulled that out of its context for your reading, and I pulled it up to the reading for week five because he ends his book with that, but I wanted to deal with application in week five so that we can uh, have those three things under our belt before we then go to apply them to the rest of the book. And so then we'll just walk right through the rest of the book, taking observation, interpretation, and application, the science, and then we're going to apply them to all of those various um, issues that he deals with in the book. And um, so we're going to work the method on all of those areas, grammar, literature, figures of speech, types and symbols, parables and allegories, prophecy, and then finally the old in the new. Okay, So uh, it's a pretty extensive uh, list of things, but hopefully when we're done, you'll have a sense of how, uh, how this operates. Okay, so any questions or comments so far about that? Okay, so um, let's talk about the reading. Um, I've I've kind of front loaded the reading a little bit. So for the reading for tonight was chapters one and two, and um, I'm also uh, discovering a few of my little typos all the way through here. I found one right up there at the top of page one. It says reading for week one, appendix page is forty eight sixty one. It should be forty eight through sixty. Page 60 ends the, um, the uh, Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, which was part of the reading for today. And then page 61 begins the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics. Now, I included both of those documents because they're just so good, and they're very, very concise. Um, you probably realize that a lot of theological writings, they can get kind of... Uh, 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 extensive, but uh, they've done a really good job with both of those documents in uh, presenting their case and then making it very concise. So we're going to be uh, looking at that a little bit uh, this evening, not the second one, but the first one, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. But uh, let's take a look at the the reading in chapters 1 and 2 and see if uh, you guys have any thoughts, questions, and um I'm not going to go over every bit of it, of course. We can't do that. But uh, Dr. Zook on page 10 begins to tell us why it's essential. Why is Bible interpretation important? And the first thing he says there, about in the middle of the page, right under that, that uh, heading, it is essential for understanding and teaching the Bible properly. Of course, that's why we want to study it for understanding and teaching. So even he is anticipating that this is not going to find an end point in you, that you are going to use these principles to not only learn the Scriptures, but then to tell other people as well. Uh, we have to do that. We are, we are uh, that body that God has left on this planet with the gospel, with the Word of God, to communicate it to other people. Somebody communicated it to somebody who communicated it to somebody who communicated it to you, right? 
And we have that responsibility as well. It's a stewardship. And uh, we need to take that very, very seriously. He even says uh, down there in, in the paragraph, the first step, observation asks, what does it say? The second step, interpretation asks the question, what does it mean? Third step, application raises the question, how does it apply to me? Okay, so he's going to, he's right on board with uh, these same three principles that we're going to be talking about. And then over on page 11, studying the Bible in this way without proper hermeneutical guidelines can lead to confusion and interpretations that are even in direct conflict. So what's at stake here is not just our personal understanding of the Bible and how we communicate it, but how we uh, are have a defense against all of the bad interpretations, false interpretations out there. And as you know, there's lots of them. It is an ocean out there, uh, an ocean of all kinds of things. Some of it good, some of it not so good. I, when I uh, used to dive in the ocean, there was things in the ocean that I wanted to eat. You know, there's salmon, halibut, scallops, things like that. You can think of some. But I also realized there was a lot of stuff out there that wants to eat me, you know. And that's kind of the way the world of uh, theology is and, and, and what we see around us. You have to be able to take the Bible and then apply it properly and accurately to uh, issues that come up. And there's always new issues popping up all the time. And it's like they're getting closer and closer together, you know. It's um, one theologian likened it to a game of whack-a-mole. Remember whack-a-mole? Uh, the only difference was the original whack-a-mole, I think there were six holes, you know, and you had one hammer. Now it's like whack-a-mole with about 40 holes, and you got to have two hammers because of the way the heresies and the false teachings pop up. Um, it's just, you know, it's an ocean out there, and it's getting worse and worse. And I think we can expect it to be worse and worse. So it's so important for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to be able to handle the Word of God uh, for those reasons and many more. We are commanded to do that in Scripture, as we're going to see. So as you turn the page to page 12, second principle here, Bible interpretation is essential as a step beyond observation. So he's going to walk you through these three stages. And then over on 13, Bible interpretation is essential for applying the Bible properly. Okay, If you don't understand what it says you're not going to have a hard time understanding what it means. And if you don't understand what it means, you're going to have a tough time applying it to your life, right? Just like that stop sign. If you don't see the stop sign, you're not going to be able to interpret it or apply it. And then you get to talk to uh, Nate. Is Nate here? You might get to talk to Nate or Rich Black or one of their colleagues, you know, and explain to them why you didn't apply the losses you have to apply, all right? So um, another part of this chapter that caught my eye was um, on page 15, seeking to determine what a passage really means is an intriguing intellectual and spiritual challenge, and it is a challenge. And then that next paragraph down below, for example, we, how do we know if a passage was intended only for the people to whom it was initially addressed or if it is intended for ensuing generations? That's a very important question. We see this in the Bible all the time. Um, do I do what, it, what was said to uh, or commanded people 2,000 years ago to do? Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe it was for them, and how do we tell? Can a passage have more than one meaning? And if so, how are they to be determined? Did some of the Bible authors write more than they understood? Is the Bible more than a human book? If it is also a divine book, how does this affect our interpretation of various passages? How are we to interpret various proverbs in the Bible? Are they universally applicable? If we believe in literal interpretation, how does that affect our understanding of figures of speech? Uh, Dave took us through Proverbs last year, you know, and we dealt with quite a bit of this thing. We're going to do it again uh, in the context of hermeneutics toward the end of the, our study. Okay, so if the Bible includes figures of speech, then is all the Bible to be interpreted in a spiritual or mystical sense? This is a gigantic issue today. There are people that would 
would share your view of Scripture, and uh, hermeneutics is going to answer the question, well then, how is it that two like-minded Christians could look at the same Bible, read the same Bible, read the same passages, and wind up in two different conclusions, or maybe a third or a fourth? How is that? Well, the answer is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics or interpretive principles are what determines where you wind up. In other words, we're talking about methodology here, the method. Methodology determines conclusions, always, 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 to the point that you show me your conclusions, I can almost sort of tell you how you got there, okay? It's almost like footprints in the snow, all right? We are all here tonight right here, okay? If you don't believe me, just trust me. We're all here right now, okay? When we're done here tonight, unless you live with somebody, you're going to take a different route home, right? A different pathway. Well, this is basically what hermeneutics is. Hermeneutics will determine your conclusions, and we're going to see that. We're going to be talking about that. Next week, we're going to be talking about two, the two ancient basic schools of interpretive thought, one from the city of Antioch and one from the city of Alexandria, and how those affected the church throughout uh, centuries of history. Okay, so any thoughts or questions you have so far on what we've talked about or anything else in the reading? Um, Dr. Zook then on page 16 goes over some some of the things, the ways that we need to think through the, the scriptures because there's some gaps. And I like the way he puts it. These are gaps. Uh, we are not part of that culture. We're separated by centuries and centuries. And so there's a time gap. There's a space gap, geographical. There are customs gap, lots and lots of them. We're going to be talking about the differences in customs and how sometimes different customs are going to um, shade how these writers said things. And then, of course, a language gap. The Bible is written in different languages than we, than we speak. You know, Old Testament Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, which is a kind of a sister language to to uh, to Hebrew. It was the language of the Chaldeans, and then of course uh, Koine or Common Greek in the New Testament. And uh, moving from one language into another, even with translations, and we have very excellent translations. Um, none of them are perfect, however. Uh, there's always difficulties, right? There's always things to overcome. Uh, no translation can perfectly communicate another language from one to the other. They just don't. They're different enough that there's not always an exact word and that type of thing. So some of these gaps are what we're going to be talking about here. Well, let's talk about the definitions of hermeneutics, okay? This is on page 19. The English word interpret, he says, right in the middle of the page, is used at times to mean explain, other times to translate. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. The Greek word hermeneuo is, is in the New Testament, and sometimes it, it means to actually interpret, but other times it can just simply mean to translate. So uh, that's uh, uh, um, foundational to what we're going to be talking about. Now on pages 20 and 21, there's uh, two different lists of terms and terminology. And you see there hermeneutics at the top of that one list on page 20. And then after that, exegesis. And then after that, exposition. And then homiletics. And then pedagogy, okay? And what I was trying to get at before, if you're learning hermeneutics in, for certain reasons, for certain purposes, like in a, in a seminary, you know you're going to be then having to do exegesis of text using the tools of hermeneutics uh, in order then to stand up and do an exposition. So exegesis essentially means you're going to draw out of the text what the text says, and exposition means then you're going to tell it to other people. Okay, And homiletics is the science, principles, and art or task by which the meaning and relevance of the biblical text are communicated in a preaching situation. So you can see the foundational necessity of understanding what the Bible says, what it means by what it says, and how to apply it before you stand up in front of other people and tell them how to change their lives, right? And unfortunately... Um, that negative thing goes on all the time. 
And uh, churches all over this nation are full of people who sit and listen to preaching every single Sunday. They're dead in their sins because they never hear the gospel. They think that just because they go to church that somehow that puts them right with God and a variety of other things. As long as the gospel isn't preached, all there's all kinds of things that people think and believe. But if they're not saved or born again, then they're um, just being confirmed in their sin in those situations. So it's a it's a horrible tragedy. And uh, uh, I know I'm thankful to, to be able to attend a church that has a high view of Scripture and that takes the Bible for what it says and then seeks to communicate it to to people. So um, this is part of the importance of understanding hermeneutics and how to use it. He says at the top of page 21, an effective expositor is first an effective exegete. Okay, You can't tell people what the Bible says unless you have learned how to draw out from the Bible what the Bible says. Okay, That's what's meant by that. So exegesis is the right way to do it, drawing it out. The Greek preposition ek means out from, out of. You want to know how to get out of this building? You look for the exit sign. That's where that prefix comes from. The opposite of that is eisegesis, reading into the text. We'll be talking about that. That's what you don't want to do. It's, uh, it's the exact opposite of what we are to do as students of the Word of God. Okay? So any thoughts or questions you might have uh, for any of any of this so far? Yeah, Simon. We're all preachers. Uh, it may not be formally from up there or here, over the backyard fence, to your children gathered around you. Um, that's where it starts, right? I mean, even the, even the requirements for being an elder in a church start where? In the home, right? But um, exegesis are the rules. Uh, I, I'm sorry, hermeneutics are the rules. Exegesis is putting them into practice. Like in football, uh, there's a set of rules, but you have to run the play. And running, you got to run the play by the rules. Okay, you can't step out of bounds. You can't do that, all, all those rules. So that's kind of the relationship between them. Um, we're going to be we're going to be moving beyond hermeneutics uh, with two or three of our lessons. There's a, and there's a couple of things in the in the notes. We're going to practice a little bit of exegesis and demonstrate it a little bit and talk about it. But basically, hermeneutics are the rules of interpretation. And the exegesis is when you apply those rules to the text, and then you're able to draw out of the text the meaning of the text. We're going to be talking about authorial intent as well. Um, the Bible is written by God, okay? He's the author. And uh, so it's very important for us to keep in mind authorial intent. And, we're, and, and as we know, he used human beings to inscripturate his word. So... Um, that's that's kind of the relationship between the two, and then but it doesn't stop there. Then it, once you draw it out of the scriptures, you, we are told by God. Then share your faith, talk to people about what you have learned. Um, so I hope that might explain it a little bit. There, we're going to be doing some of that. We're going to be doing some exercises where where you guys can can put it into practice as well. So anything else? Any other thoughts you might have? No, what? Tell people what the Bible says. Well, as we understand it, it, it tends to be more formal up in front of a group of people as part of a worship service. Exactly. But the bottom line is it's still telling people what God says. Telling people what God says. And, and as, as you know, I mean, there are preachers of various styles and kinds, and there are some when you would describe them as a teacher preacher, and there's others that would be more of a homiletician. Um, it, and it differs from like a classroom setting where you're not going to have interaction probably, you know, and uh, teaching is a little more um, getting down and, and, and looking at the text. Ultimately, it has to be the same thing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think about teaching any different than you would preaching, in the sense. It's simply a different style. And oftentimes, um, 
In other words, in the preaching courses I took, they, they drilled it into us, a lot of things. You, you have one idea. You have one idea in a sermon. If you have a passage you're dealing with, and you come up, or a paragraph or something, and you come up with more than one idea, basic idea, you have two sermons. And so they want the, they want the listener to be able to have portability and to walk out that door with the Word of God embedded in their mind with some principles. And um, we'll be talking about this too. Uh, someone like John MacArthur, one of the things that makes him such an exceptional preacher, he's, uh, there's a variety of things, of course, he is the master of what's called the expositional statement. Okay, Dave, you, <laughs> you're familiar with that. An expositional statement is something they teach you how to do from your exegesis. Uh, one of the hardest things to get a recent seminary grad to do is to move beyond the exegesis because they've spent years, you know, studying languages and all that stuff. And then, and then they get out and what are they familiar with? The, the geeky, greeky stuff. And sometimes it's difficult to get them to move beyond that. And think about the people that are listening and how would you explain that to that person, you know? And um, so, so that's part of it. it you, you have to move beyond exegesis when you're preaching into exposition and uh, make expositional statements. An expositional statement, an exegetical statement is text-bound and time-bound. In other words, Paul told Timothy to preach the Word. Okay, That's an exegetical statement in 2 Timothy 4.2. But an expositional statement would be a timeless text-derived statement where you might say something like, we all have a responsibility to communicate the Word to other people, that type of thing. You listen to MacArthur preach. He, he moves from exegesis to expositional statements like that. It's imperceptible. You don't even know he's doing it. But you walk out the door with a portable principle in your mind, and you go, wow, that was a good teacher. He's a good preacher. Well, that's one reason why. He's an expert at the expositional statement. He creates a statement that is exegetically sound because he's done his exegesis, he's a good theologian, but then he's able to turn that into a portable, universal truth that you can walk out the door with and apply in your life. Okay? So that's kind of the end result of doing this. And uh, so it's not just telling people what it says, but also helping them understand how it applies to their life. Right? We would do that with anybody, hopefully. So... Any, any other thoughts or questions you might have? I'm going to try to follow the same format we had before. We'll go roughly 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. Um, tonight might be a little shorter. We've, I think we're allowing, what, hour and a half? We're about an hour and a half. So um, next week, the second lesson is going to maybe be a little longer, okay? We're going to have, have quite a bit we need to pack into that one. But um, the second chapter of this book, chapter 2, Bible Interpretation, Then and Now. So uh, how many of you guys were here for the, for the uh, study we did in the history of uh, theology? We used this book. Yeah, okay. Um, Dr. Zook is going to cover quite a bit of the same information, going back and looking at these uh, different schools of interpretation. And uh, you're going to even recognize some of the same names that were in this one. Um, people like Origen, Augustine, uh, those ty- kind of people. And uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this right now, um, other than to say what's, what you're going to see when you, when you read through this and what we're going to talk about next time are these two basic schools of interpretive thought. Okay, One in Antioch, Antioch up in Syria, it's sometimes called Antioch on the Orontes because it's on the Orontes River. And, uh, and there is another Antioch mentioned in Scripture called Pisidian Antioch up to the north in the north part and uh, in a different province. So there's those two different cities. The uh, city of Antioch became known for its literal interpretation. And remember who was there, right? The Apostle Paul was there. Barnabas was there. Antioch was that place where they launched missionary journeys out. So they were, they were well grounded in apostolic doctrine and how to interpret Scripture. And then the other school of thought that developed 
was in Alexandria, Egypt. It's over, it's down near the, the Nile Delta. In fact, it's in the sort of the western part of the Nile Delta. It's right on the Mediterranean there. That developed a whole school of thought that primarily was a, an approach to scripture that was allegorical. We talked about it, and this book also talks about it. So you'll see those two streams of thought. What happened was the Antiochian school over the next uh, 150, 200 years fell by the wayside, and the Alexandrian school of interpretation sort of took precedent, okay? And the allegorical method came into the church. And by that time, of course, uh, over the next two or three centuries, the church was the Catholic church. And so this is why Catholicism basically ruled all through the Dark Ages. And um, up until the Reformation, there was, uh, you didn't have a copy of the Bible. You didn't know anything about the Word of God, possibly couldn't even read. Um, and you were totally dependent <laughs> on the priests to tell you what the Bible said and to do what they told you to do because they were the authorities. Remember, the Catholic Church is an attempt to reconstruct the Levitical system. Okay? has all the trappings, priesthood, altars, ongoing sacrificial system, and it's a great big sacral structure. Okay, When I say sacral, I mean the, the essential meaning of that is a geographical area dominated by a religion of some kind. In other words, it's religion applied to a geographic area. So you wind up with the bishop of some city, the bishop of this place. And they were totally dependent on the interpretations of the Catholic Church. And when the Reformation came around, the Reformation of doctrine that we know about, primarily is the doctrines of salvation, that came about because there was a Reformation of hermeneutics. Okay, There would never have been a Reformation of doctrine until there was a Reformation of hermeneutics. Basically, they just opened the Bible and studied the Bible in the right way. Now, they didn't completely reform all things, but that's how you wound up with what we call the Reformation. And um, there, the, you find these quotes from, from even people like Luther and, and Calvin who basically are, are, are denigrating the allegorical method of interpretation. And really, and sometimes especially with Luther, some uh, very uh, frank language, right? Now, they weren't um, consistent in that, but they were also operating within that massive structure of the, the Catholic Church and all of that uh, hierarchy that was there. So we'll be talking about that some next time. And uh, it really boils down to the basic difference between a literal interpretation. We're going to be talking about what it means by literal and that which is not literal, allegorical, and even sometimes spiritualizing the text of Scripture. So... Um, any other thoughts you might have on that? Chapter 2 is, is going to go through sort of the history of interpretation. Um, and it's going to, uh, here is even his chart, timeline of major Bible interpreters, okay? And you're going to see some of these same names that, that you saw in the uh, study we did uh, last time. And as uh, he closes out chapter 2, Dr. Zook says this, this brief review of the history of hermeneutics shows that it is essential that evangelicals continue to stress the historical, grammatical, literary approach to the Bible. We'll be hearing, you'll be hearing that over and over again. Historical, grammatical, literal approach to the Bible. Only this approach, as developed in this book, enables believers to understand God's Word properly as the basis for godly living. See how he connects the understanding with how we live? That's the, uh, that's the end result. If, if your study of the Bible doesn't change your life, something's not right. You have, to, you have to understand and study the Bible with change in mind. When you hear a message, you should be thinking, how do I apply this to my life? What, if you walk out that door and uh, it hasn't changed your life, something's not right. Okay, It must do that. I want to just spend a minute or so on the appendix, and um, m m those articles there, I hope you find the time to read those. And like I say, I've weighted the reading kind of heavy up front, so I understand if it's, <laughs> if it's a little tough to get through. For example, reading for today 
was going to be 13 pages of these notes and then two chapters of the book. Reading for next week will be 16 pages, but only one chapter. So so from page 61 down to 76 for next next week. So you'll be able to uh, work your way through those. I just wanted to spend just a minute or two on the definition of biblical hermeneutics. So let's look at page 48 in your notes. These articles are from this group called gotquestions.org, and I find them so far to be pretty sound. And one of the things I like about them is they're concise. You know, I mean, it's you can find theological expositions of things that just take months, you know, but these guys have a way of being concise, but also uh, good and sound, and they have thousands of questions you can look up on these things. So I use them quite a bit in Sunday school and for teaching like this because I think they provide people with a good, basic understanding of what the question is. And so on page 48, this question, what is biblical hermeneutics? Biblical hermeneutics is a study of the principles and methods of interpretation, interpreting the text of the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 commands believers to be involved in hermeneutics. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker correctly handles the word of truth. So the purpose of biblical hermeneutics is to help us to know how to properly interpret, understand, and apply the Bible. There's those three principles, a little different wording, but it's exactly the same thing. Observation, interpretation, application. And then they also deal with um, some of the abnormal ways or the aberrations right there in the middle. Any attempt to spiritualize the number or to deny a literal miracle is to do injustice to the text and ignore the purpose of language, which is to communicate and so on. And then he also mentions in that uh, next chapter, next paragraph down, a second crucial law of biblical hermeneutics is that passages must be interpreted historically, grammatically, and contextually. You're going to hear this over and over and over again. We have to understand the history of it in its historical context. We have to understand the grammar that is being used there, because God chose to communicate to us in languages. Okay, Sometimes you'll see it term propositional truth, statements that can be heard, understood, evaluated, and in languages that have the words have grammar. Okay, So we have to understand something about the grammar and, of course, contextually, the context that it's in. Who's talking? Who's he talking to? What's the situation? Just think about it. Um, any, any situation you can think of in, in history, you know, uh, my parent generation grew up in the Great Depression in the 1930s, and then they went through World War II, okay? Those people had a certain context. My father was the youngest of four kids. He had two older brothers, an older sister. He joined the United States Marine Corps the day after his 18th birthday, which was October 31st, 1941, okay? And so you know what happened a month later. His two older brothers were already in the service because everybody knew they were going to war. He, w- he joined the Marine Corps. The other uh, uncle was in the Marine Corps. The other older one, he was in the Army. All three combat veterans in the South Pacific. Um, my oldest uncle, he a lot of campaigns. He was on Okinawa. Uh, my dad was with the Marine Corps Air Wing. They flew the uh, inverted gullwing Corsairs. You've probably seen those. He wasn't a pilot. He was just a young kid, ground crew guy. Never talked much about it, but what he did tell me, it was, boy, really something. Uh, My other uncle, Uncle Bob, he was the only man in his company uh, that wasn't killed or wounded when the 2nd Marine Division assaulted Tarawa. And so those guys had a history. They had a context, you know, and we do too, and so do the biblical writers. Um, There's a religious context. There's cultural, social, and all those. You have to take that into consideration when you're interpreting the Word of God. So that's a pretty good little article there, I think. And then um, there's one on the next page, 49. What does it mean that the Bible is inspired? We're going to talk about inspiration. Uh, that's We're going to do that right now here for a, in a few minutes. And um, the, 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 the nature of Scripture is due to the nature of the God who spoke it, right? 
This is how we understand Scripture being what it is. It's because it is the Word of God. Now we say, okay, what is that God like? So your theology proper, as it's called, your understanding of who God is and what He is like, is going to inform your understanding of what His Word is like. Okay, So that's just uh, how, how we're going to approach that. And then on page 50, is there proof for the inspiration of Bible? That's a good article there. <clears throat> and then um, the next page, 51, what is verbal plenary inspiration? Okay, So I hope you will go through those. And, and these are foundational truths because... Uh, if you understand that what you're reading and studying and you're maybe getting ready to tell somebody else, if you understand it for what it truly is, that's going to change how you approach the Scriptures. Okay, And uh, again, you th think back to people that don't do it right from the pulpit. It's because they have a very low view of God. If you have a very low view of God, you have a low view of His Word. Okay, You can always tell. It always follows, just like night follows day. If somebody has a low view of Scripture, they have a low view of God. It just, it's just the way it is. Well, then on page 52, this is just a brief word study of this word. Um, the Greek word, hermenuo, okay? It actually comes from the, the Greek god Hermes, the god of speech or writing. And um, it, it takes various forms in the New Testament, okay? It can be compounded by adding prepositions to it. One of them is the preposition that's there on the right, dia. It means through or by means of. The other one is meta, after or beyond. So it, it, it occurs in these various forms. The uh, diermenuo, right there in the middle, to interpret through. That is to say fully or to explain. And again, the word is, is used in a variety of ways, Sometimes to explain something, but also sometimes to interpret. Okay, so it has both meanings. Depends on the context. It is used in Luke twenty four twenty seven, which is a key passage we're going to be talking about in that in that form. That's the form that occurs in Luke twenty four twenty seven, and then the, down below there, the other one is met ermenuo to translate from one language into another. And there are several references there where it's used in that way. But in Luke 24, 27 there, moving on down to the bottom, dermenu sen, that's the, now we're going to talk about the grammar of it because you see how it's spelled differently. That's the verb. It's third person singular aorist active indicative. That's the parsing of it. From the base form dermenuo to interpret. Okay. And then uh, going on down, there's the verse, Luke 24, 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Now, that's a, that's a really critical passage because that passage is a, what we would call a crooks interpretum, okay? That's, that's like a little battlefield there, that verse. Because you remember the disciples on the, after the resurrection were walking down the road to Emmaus and, and they encountered Jesus. They didn't recognize him. Um, and yet, uh, after some interaction with him, it says, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Some people read that and they say, because he did that, you need to then interpret the Old Testament looking for Jesus in every place in the Old Testament, because that's what that means. Other people say, no, that's not what that means in that regard. Oh, yes, you, could, you should read the Old Testament understanding the redemptive purpose and plan of God. But if you go searching for Jesus in every single nook and cranny of the Old Testament, you're going to have to force him into places where he may not be. Okay? And this is kind of the difference between an allegorical or spiritualizing of the text and then let or letting the text tell you what it says. I mean, at the, at, uh, let's say, uh, the, 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 the incident at Sodom and Gomorrah, where the men of Sodom wanted to have uh, forcible sex with the beautiful angels of God, and then God destroyed them, right? Now, how are you going to read Jesus into that? Where is he in there, right? Now, that's just a crude example, but 
you, you, can, you, you wind up with all kinds of uh, misinterpretations if you take that approach. You have to let the text tell you what it says. So we'll be coming back to that passage. I just wanted to kind of alert you to it. Luke 24 is a, uh, is a passage where there's a lot of departure of methodology, okay? And um, that's based on that word, diermenuo, to interpret through. He interpreted through the Old Testament. Um, wherever it spoke about him, he explained it to him. What we're going to be talking about is a couple of different approaches to understanding the Old Testament. Um, and it's, it's, that approach is what, what is commonly called um, Christocentric. You have to see Jesus in every part of the Bible, a part of the Old Testament. But a better approach, and there's an article in there that you're going to be, be looking at, is a Christotelic approach. Telos or endpoint or result. In other words, you should read the Old Testament understanding that everything points to and finishes with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, of course. But that's different than looking back in the other direction and say everything then has to be, he has to be there in everything. Do you see the difference? <laughs> Um, and it, that's a, it's a real uh, theological battlefield because it's a real hermeneutical battlefield. Okay, that's uh, for our purposes. That's why I wanted to bring that out. And um, one of the brothers mentioned uh, Dr. Uh, Abner Chow from the Master Seminary. He's written just a really fine book on hermeneutics, where he he takes you through the Christotelic approach to Scripture. It's a it's um, as, as as anybody who's there, anybody has you ever listened to Abner Chow? Know who Dr. Chow is? He's just an incredible scholar. Um, if you hear him, you you realize this guy can pack an awful lot into a short space. Okay, I first heard him at the master or at the uh, uh, Shepherds Conference 2017, and I went to listen to his breakout session, and it was so crowded I sat on the floor. Okay. And uh, for an hour and 15 minutes, he just boom, 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 rapid fire right through his topic. And it, it, he can pack an awful lot into a, a small space. He's just an exceptional scholar. But that book on hermeneutics and his approach is to say, OK, like like I mentioned earlier, we need to look at how the Bible interprets the Bible. And so he takes you right through and talks about how do the prophets interpret the prophets and the prophets are looking at and interpreting other prophets. Then how do, do the disciples of Jesus interpret the Old Testament? And then how does Jesus interpret Scripture, right? And then how did the early church do it? And once the apostolic uh, period closed, things got wacko real quick, okay? And um, there was a lot of aberrations that took place. But uh, we need to model our hermeneutics on how the biblical people, writers, authors, apostles, prophets, and Christ himself interpreted the Bible. Okay? So that's going to be our approach. So let's go back to uh, the front of your notes and spend a few minutes here on page 3. We've already touched on this. But again, from Dr. Ram's Protestant Biblical Interpretation there at the top of the page, the primary need for a system of hermeneutics is to ascertain the meaning of the Word of God. Okay? And that's a uh, very simple sounding statement, <coughs> but uh, you would be surprised to know how many variations and how many aberrations there are and how many people professing to be followers of Jesus Christ, would disagree with what he just said there. And it's interesting, too, there. Now, I've directed you to a quote by Walter Kaiser on page 95. And uh, um, Walter Kaiser's quote is updated more. So I want you to compare his statement something like 30 years later, and he talks about some hermeneutical issues that, that are there. And every generation has its own issues to deal with. And one of the good things about taking the principles from Scripture and building your hermeneutical tool chest is you have the Bible's own methodology for interpreting the Bible. Okay, You can, you can use that your entire life. If you base your hermeneutical principles on something other than Scripture, you're, you're gonna not going to be able to hang on to that very long Okay, because it's going to change. It's going to have to change. 
the, the, script, the principles that we learn from Scripture on how to interpret Scripture, you can apply them cover to cover right through the Bible, and you can apply them down through the years. Okay, You don't have to change them. When I first studied uh, Bernard Ram's book, nothing's changed. I mean, hopefully I've gotten better at it, but uh, the principles themselves are exactly the same. Okay, So, starting there, uh, the reason for our study, God's Word is inerrant. The original autographs, in their particulars, contain no error. Okay, how about Proverbs thirty, verse five? Who's got? Who's the lucky out of the starting blocks here? Can't remember who I gave it to. Okay, every word of God is pure. That's just one of many, many, many statements in Scripture about the Scripture itself. So the Bible bears witness to itself about the nature of the Bible. Okay, and then how about Psalm twelve, verse six? Yeah, you hear the imagery there about the purity of it? And that that picture, that metaphor, those people and would understand exactly what that meant, and uh, we can understand it as well. Okay, how about Matthew 5, 17 and 18? Okay, you hear the particularity, the granularity of Jesus' understanding of the Old Testament? It wasn't concepts. You're gonna. We'll run into this. We'll run into people who say, "Well, see, the Bible is really not the inspired word of God. It's it's just you have to understand the concepts. You know, the 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 big picture things that are there, and uh, you know, you can do an awful lot with big pictures, right? That have no relevance to the scriptures at all. But Jesus is talking about jot or tittle. Okay, the jot that is the yod of the Hebrew that looks like a little comma. It's a small letter, little comma, yod. Tittle would be the difference between a, a resh or a, a line like that and a line that had a little tail on it, okay? Just a little, just a simple little mark. He's being that particular, that granular about the fulfillment of the law because he was going to be the one to fulfill it, okay? Every little part and piece of it. And then B, God's Word is infallible, inerrant, infallible. The original autographs in their totality make no mistakes. And, and you're going to see how these things, it, they build on one another. I mean, it only makes sense, right? If it's without error, error then it's, uh, there are no mistakes in it. How about Psalm 19.7? Yeah. You hear how it makes a statement and then it makes an application? Here's what the Lord, here's what the Word of God is like, and here's what it does. Psalm 19 is just a tremendous psalm about, about the nature of the Word of God all the way through it. And then how about Romans 7, 12? The, the moral nature of it, it's, it's holy. Uh, part of Paul's argument about the Word of God is that it's, uh, you know, it's, and, then, and remember, that's in the context of the Jews perverting the Word of God and taking it and turning it into this horrific burden that they just placed on people. And it, it in many cases, it built resentment, you know, and uh, anger against the Word of God. But it wasn't the Word of God itself, which is holy, as, as he read. It was the way it was being applied to people and used to uh, burden people under that massive load. And then this verse is a classic, 2 Timothy 3.16. We'll be talking about this one quite a few times. Yeah. Inspired and um, theopneustos. Theopneustos, compound word, God breathed. Okay? God breathed. The greatest statement probably in the New Testament about the nature of, of Scripture as it comes from God. It's God breathed. Okay? And then again, a statement of its value, what it does. And... Uh, also a statement of its sufficiency to do all those things, to equip us, to prepare us, to, uh, to do in us what God would have us do. And then God's Word is authoritative. Inerrancy and infallibility produces authority for all doctrine and life. 1 Corinthians 14.37. Yep, it's the commands of God. <clears throat> and then uh, Matthew 28, 18-20, very familiar passage. Okay? Starts out all authority, all authority. And then part of that, teaching them to do what? To obey. Okay, so it's authoritative to accomplish what God would have it do. And then James 2.10. So there you have a view of the comprehensive nature of the law of God. You can't chop it up into bite-sized chunks and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey this part, but not that part. You can't do that. 
you have to understand the law and its holistic nature, okay? So then we're going to come down to something maybe a little more personal, the requirements for our study, okay? Now, this, this is just basic biblical understanding. In order to fully understand and comprehend and then apply the Word of God in our lives, we must be saved, okay? In other words, we must be regenerate. We must be born from above. And this comes from, of course, Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. He's saying you must be born again to a (laughs) Pharisee. This guy would have been a a brilliant Old Testament scholar, okay? Those guys essentially would memorize the entire Old Testament. I mean, and, and when he says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things, that is a baseball bat of a rebuke. Okay, I mean, that's to say that to a Pharisee, that'd be like say, saying to a, well, I don't know, like a Supreme Court justice, you're qualified to be a Supreme Court justice and you can't tell the difference between a male and a female? <laughs> of course, that's never going to happen. Anyway, there's an awful lot there, but... <sighs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> we must be saved, regenerate, born from above. It is a requirement to really fully understand the Word of God. A lot of people don't understand the Bible because they're just not saved. There's a, there's a theological term, the concomitant working of Word and Spirit. Concomitant working of Word and Spirit. Apart from the presence of the Spirit when you're saved, you cannot understand the Word of God. If you don't know Christ, you need to trust Him as your Lord and Savior. Okay, You just need to do that. And I would encourage you, I would urge you, do it quickly. Jesus didn't say you must become born again. That's a different word. He uses a stative verb, be born again. He doesn't use the word genomai, which means you must become. And even when he says he doesn't get it, he doesn't tell him how to do it. Right? The sovereignty of God and salvation is just all over that passage. He doesn't say, well, you got to have step A, B, C, and D. Go through this gate and that gate and that gate. He doesn't do that. He says, like the wind. You can't tell. You can see the effect of it, but you can't predict it. You don't know. And um, that must have frustrated Nicodemus. But salvation is just critical. And second, we must be learners. This is Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Learn from me. Pretty simple, huh? Learn from me. Learn of me. That's part of our why we should study the Bible. And by the way, that is a, an invitation to people to come to Christ to be saved. The verse that precedes that is a verse of the absolute sovereignty of God. No one knows the Father but the Son and those to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. That's verse 27. That's the sovereignty of God and salvation. You can't know God apart from knowing the Son. Okay? And then the very next verse, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. So right there you have... You know, this is not a theology class, but you have the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man right there, just like that in Scripture, snuggled up right next to each other, okay? There's not an effort to try to explain them or reconcile them, but they're both right there, okay? So uh, Matthew 11, 27, 28 through 29 have both those right there. But we must be learners. We must want to learn the Word of God. And we must approach God and His Word reverently. From Isaiah 66... To this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. The divine requirements for approaching God are that we would be humble. Okay, He's going to reveal to us truth by his spirit. Again, the necessity of being saved. You can't can't understand God's word rightly apart from salvation. And we must be contrite of spirit, broken in spirit. When you come to Christ, that's a requirement for coming. Humble yourself before God and and know that He he can save you, and He's the only one who can save you. And He's the only one who can teach us from His Word and then tremble at His Word. Okay, That's our approach. And then D, we must long or hunger for God's Word. This is 1 Peter 2.2. Yeah, how does a baby long for milk? Well, any of you dads? with uh, nursing babies. You know how a hungry baby responds to the milk? When they, Yeah. That's how we are to approach the Word of God. Okay? And uh, how about uh, Psalm 42, 1 and 2? Famous, well-known verse, as the deer pants for the water brook. 
We, if we want to know God and long to know God better, we have to know him through his word because that's how he reveals himself, through his word. And then we must study in complete dependence on the spirit of God. This is 1 Peter 1.10. Now, I had a little typo there. It should say 1 Peter 1.10 through 12. You hear the dependence that they had on the spirit of God to reveal to them even the very things that they had prophesied, Okay. Dependence on God, and we just certainly are. This next one's a little bit long, but I kind of had to include the whole thing because it's just such an important chapter to understand our dependence on God. This First 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, you hear the repetitive spirit, the spirit, the spirit. And, um, that, <laughs> that verse, the natural man, the man who is unsaved, it, it, the Word of God, he hears it, and he may be even smart enough to understand most of it in a certain way. But ultimately, its real meaning is foolishness to him. And then there's a statement of that inability. Neither can he know them. He can't know the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're spiritually communicated through the Holy Spirit, and he's spiritually dead. Spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, spiritually dead as a post. Okay? impossible for an unsaved person to understand the things of the Spirit of God. And the concomitant working of word and spirit is that principle that uh, is in play there. Okay. Well, then number three, the results of our study. We should anticipate the, that a study in the Word of God is going to change our lives. Okay. And uh, from Romans 12, 1 and 2, we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2 uses the word we get the word metamorphosis from it, the Greek word metamorpho, to be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, right? The very next word, verse, he uses the word think three times. Think, 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 okay? The mind is so critical, and we have to trust that the Spirit of God will help us understand the Word of God. This is Those articles on illumination will uh, we'll talk about that as well transformation by the renewing of our minds, okay? And then the, these next two, I got those in reverse order. So we're going to start with C because 2 Timothy 2.15 comes before 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. So C, we will be equipped to handle God's word rightly. This is 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay, yeah. And notice how it's an appeal to the will. Um, it's just a, to a saved person, but it's still an appeal to the will. Be diligent, work hard at it. And uh, so critical. We will be equipped for every good work, um, rightly dividing the word of, of God. And then we will be equipped for every good work. C is going to come uh, before B. The last one here will be B. This is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We've seen it already, and we're going <laughs> to we're going to hear it again. But let's let's listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. There you go. All scripture is God breathed, and then it has an effect to equip us for all of those things. And you read the rest of that passage, Paul moves right into a, an exhortation. Really, it's a charge to Timothy in chapter 4. You know, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and so on. And he says, preach the word. So he talks about the word and what it does and what it accomplishes. And then he commands him, preach the word. Okay. So there you have it. The reason for our study, the requirements for our study, and the results. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.